And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us back from Studio Hex, previously developing... Um, Hellborn, now coming to us with a little, something a little bit more Fae-leaning with Midnight Glamours. The one and only Alcastelli, a.k.a. Fern the Hex. How you doing today, man? I've been doing pretty great. A bit of a sore throat, but other than that, I've been doing pretty, pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think some people are surprised I don't have a sore throat with all, with all the work I do on this thing. Oh. Eh, I commute a lot. Maybe I've caught something while I was on a bus or a train. Probably. That'd be the, that'd be the place to do it. Yeah. Uh, Anyhow, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yep. So, I know it has, it has been a fair, it has been a fair bit, and there's been a few deve developments here, developments here and there. There was, there was that whole thing with the contest, which I, on my server, which I'd, Admittedly, I didn't do the be the best with, and one of the guys and and when I did the drawing, I had to I had to go with a secondary because the one of the people involved didn't have a Steam account. Ah, well, that's okay. I did mo I did that mostly because uh, on top of having my own studio, I also am an intern for another uh, studio, mm -hmm. and I wanted to do a bit of an advertisement, try to get as many people to you know find out about this product of theirs. So that's okay. It's nothing that really bothers me. Mm -hmm. It was a secondary job. Uh, yeah, I can... I can get that. Now, with that, with that said, last, the last game I had you on for was, was of course, Hellborn, which was doing your, which was doing your own spin on, on, on hell and that and uh, that end of the supernatural. Mm-hmm. And for Midnight Glamours, you've gone into more of a modern mythos approach dealing with the Fae. So Correct. I the I suppose the first question to ask is what prompt what gave you the idea to use to use the Fae as the basis for this project? Give me its origin story. So for Midnight Glamour's, well, after I was done with Hellborn or was reaching a bit of a final stage in development, I was thinking of what's going to be my next project. And I had, you know, brainstormed a variety of ideas. Something inspired from Guilty Gear, a game about flying, just space samurai, another game about you hunting ghosts or being cursed. I also really got into some of the other World of Darkness games, more specifically the Changeling games, both The Dreaming and The Lost. And at some point, I had thought of this game about you being someone who's cursed, and you are dealing with the things that cursed you. You're the only guy who can figure that out. Originally, it was ghosts, but then I decided to do something a bit more interesting. Fairies. Which I feel are a bit, are a bit, are a bit underrepresented in modern media. Yeah, a lot of ghosts, a lot of demons, perhaps a few more mythological monsters, say dragons, but not a lot of fairies. Or anything fae related. Mm -hmm. I I can certainly get that. And there's been pl there's been plenty of appearance of, of fae in media, but it's usually as part of usually as part of a bigger whole of that motif of what I call modern mythos. You know, a lot, yeah. a lot of the you. You grew up in you grew up in the '90s as much as I as much as I did, so you pr you probably saw your fair share of the of those shows, ga games, and the like that were doing, well, doing the idea of ur of urban fantasy. Well, I grew up in the 2000s, but my dad had a lot of like games about that. Mm -hmm. I grew up with a lot of retro stuff, so I managed to see most of them. Yeah, the point is there there was in the late in the late '90s and. A, and a bit of the two thousands, there was that trend of ne of neo gothic and again modern mythos. Yeah, like gargoyles. 
for example. Yeah. That cartoon. Gargoyles is one example. The Buffy versus is one example. Supernatural. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, don't worry. Yeah. And within all, within all of the, within all of that, you the Fae are present, but they're just one of a grab bag of mythologies that are drawn upon. Pretty much. Whereas with this, that's the that's the entire focus. focus. Correct. And I will ad- I will admit one of the one of the other things that drew my attention is the fact that you're going with a card based motif, which I still I will still argue that the full potential of of cards in TTRPGs has not been explored. Which is also why I decided to delve into that. Mm-hmm. Well, it's mostly partly because of one, I want to experiment a bit with what I wanted to make. I didn't want, I didn't want to pick another another game with use like D twelves, D sixes, D twenties, and because card based systems haven't been fully explored. Sure, there are games where you like use cards for other stuff, such as say uh, Savage Worlds. But there hasn't been a game. That, but I don't think there are many games that use cards for everything. There's been there's been a handful, but in my opinion, not enough. Yeah, that's what I mean. There have been a few, but not many. I mean, obviously, obviously, the Saga Machine fam- family of games is is one bi- is one big case. But there's st- there's stuff like the old um, Saga system that TSR did back in '95. There's the Faith RPG, which we re- which um. Xanatrix and I recently covered on this channel. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I I know some people will will say that you use cards in Savage Worlds. You only use cards for initiative and combat. Yeah, and that that's, that's what I said. There are a few games you just use them for secondary things, but it's but they're not the primary way of resolving things, be it combat or challenges, etc. Mm-hmm. And. I've seen I've seen some argue that the reason for that is that it is it's hard it's hard to get cards to work in tabletop, which I have a hard time believing because it is stupidly easy to get a deck of playing cards. These days. yeah, this is why I also want to use uh, playing cards because well, Mega Glam is a zing game. It's supposed to be small, compact, easy to pick up and play, at least relatively so. And pe- more people carry playing cards around than you know d twenties. Or even D6s. Mm-hmm. And, of, cu- of course, it's going to be easy to carry than, ha- than the pound of dice that some games are going to require, looking at you, Shadowrun. Yeah. But, with the... Now, with... Now, with how it with how it works for mid for midnight glamours, there's, um, I'd like you, I'd like you to go over how the how the card is going to be used for the core mechanic in this setup. Is it, it is it an aim high approach? Is it an aim low? Is it sh- is it shoot for twenty one? Um, how is it how is it working with your system? I'll experiment with how that would work. I will not lie. I had thought of something like aim for twenty one in the past or something more related to gambling. For better or for worse. But later on, I ended up with something like this. So, each character, creature, perhaps items in the environment, have a thing called Aspects. If you're familiar with the City of Mist system, it's sort of like the tags, where mm-hmm. they represent a thing about, about a character or object. Their size, some supernatural property, their appearance, and they're rated from 1 to 5, depending on how important or powerful they are. Now, whenever you want to do something, that you have to draw a number of cards equal to an attribute. One of the four attributes, those being... Uh, I need to remember exactly because... Uh, I, I, make no, I have also a few other side projects on top of Metal Glamour, so I usually forget a few of the, the rules in between. So, the attributes for Metal Glamours are Insight, Brawn, Presence, and Trick. Essentially, Intelligence, Strength, Charisma, and Agility. And those four stats are, uh, uh, what's the word? 
Uh, they're, associated, they're associated with one of the four suit of cards. Clubs, hearts, spades, and diamonds, respectively. Now, on a call, you draw a number of cards equal to your attribute and as many aspects that you can argue you can positively use, uh, beneficially use in your role. In your draw, sorry. Like, for example, you're trying to cross over a fence. For example, because you're athletic, because the fence is short, you can get a few bonuses. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the GM does the same. He draws a number of cards equal to the difficulty of the call, and also gets more cards depending on as many aspects that they can use to, you know, detriment you. On the other, like, for example, you're tired, or uh, you're, ha you're actively bleeding, meaning that you cannot easily climb over the fence. And then you see how many cards you get that are of the equal that have the same suit as the item you use. If it's a figure like a queen, a jack, or a, or a king, that counts. They count as a hit if they are of the same color. And aces are success regardless of color or suit. Mm -hmm. I probably didn't explain it precisely or like well enough because, well. I'm just chaotic. Sometimes I stumble upon my own words. Chaos is something that I am very, very well accustomed to. Which is good, to some extent. I will not lie. But, if... Uh, I remember when I looked at the um, prototype you had se you had sent some time ago. And the, vi the vibe that I got of, of it is... You're drawing, you are drawing a number of cards equal to your stat... If the in order for a task to succeed, you need to dr you need to draw a card a card of the same suit, um, of the same color, or if it's a court card or an ace. Correct. That was in the prototype. Mm -hmm. A few things have changed since the prototype, mm -hmm. because we've gotten feedback. We asked other people, all the zine makers, for their opinions, and of course, feedback is always important to create a bit. Creating a better game. I've learned my mistake for, for all about not getting enough feedback with Hellborn because it has suffered because of the luck of the lack of feedback or people, you know, helping me with you know figuring out some of the rules, fixing some stuff or proofreading some parts. So I'm not gonna try to get uh, make the same mistake again. That aside, though. Now that that does bring me one question. Um, how would how would you handle this system if you're dealing with higher difficult if a situation which has a higher difficulty is going to come into play? Well, hmm. Higher difficulty, as in, got any examples? Um, so I can better understand what you're asking. You know, in a lot of games that have a st that have a static difficulty that you're trying to overcome when performing a task, yeah, uh, it'll usually if it's it'll usually be a higher or lower TN de depending on if you're aiming high or aiming low. With so with this one, it seems that if you if you manage to get the ma the matching setup, then you pass. But how would but that's that's a baseline thing. So if someone's trying to do a task that's meant to be more difficult, meant to have a higher chance of failure, how would the, how would the resolution mechanic ac account for that? At that point, it's really just a challenge between who can get more cards, the GM or the player, mm -hmm. because that's what it practically boils down to. It's who can get the more the more cards and hopefully score more hits on the other person. If the GM scores more hits, you fail. If you if you if you score more hits, you succeed. So in the so in this case, it's just is that's so. If I've got this right, then getting getting a being being able to get a card that's the same suit as the attribute you're using, that's a hit. Um, getting a or the same call or the same call if it's an ace or a king, jack, or queen. Mm -hmm. Yes. I I know that there's additional effects if you get a if you get either the base ones and an ace, but 
Is there any additional effect if you if a court card is used instead? Uh, no. It's simply uh, court cards are simply have a higher chance of succeeding. Instead of being a twenty five percent, it's a fifty percent because it's going to be either black or red. Yeah. Or or any other color if you're using a different colored deck. Well, what I mean by court card is um face cards. You know, jack, king, and queen. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I understood that. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other thing is when it comes to the um, when it comes to the bonuses or the temporary aspects with critical successes, um, mm -hmm. would those would those stack through through a scene or or not? Largely depends on the on the temporary aspect. If you got something like well. Temporary aspects are primarily, primarily given out when specific things happen. For example, you are hit by a lot of you're on fire. Uh, I think you're looking most into the prototype side of things, mm -hmm. because not any, you don't get temporary aspects anymore from critical successes. Although you can, the gym can reward you with them. It's not unlikely. But at least for me, I'd say that yes, they would stack. Though of course, they don't last for a long amount of time. Yeah. If you're on fire, you want to be on fire for multiple scenes. Because the way, at least how I imagine the game is run, it's all like a series where you have scene one, scene two, scene three, changing places between the scenes, and then different scene. Like, for example, going to a club and everything that happens in that club is a scene. Hmm. And then switching to form a car chase from the club to somewhere else, that's another scene. And reaching the final destination is another scene. Yeah. Now, with with that in with that in mind, oh, uh, since I, is is um when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to those benefits, is it just that when if you have that benefit when doing a um a call a call in that scene, you're drawing one more card than normal. Well, not just one more card. Uh, depending on the strength of the aspect, which is written from 1 to 5, you draw an equal number of cards. Mm -hmm. If you have an aspect that is like uh, Superhuman Strength 5, you get 5 more cards. Meanwhile, if it's like minor, uh, something like, uh, say, uh, what's the word? Rusty Athlete, where, aka you haven't really, uh, you are an athlete, but you haven't really trained much in the, in the latest years. And has a score of one. You only draw one card. That was a, that was a very recent addition. Originally, it was just yep, one card, one extra card per aspect. But because some aspects would be obviously more powerful than the others, you would have would have to like or add a system where some were obviously more powerful than the others. Which I, I can certainly get that. Now, I know that a good amount has changed since the prototype, but has the concept of willpower changed, which se seemed to be this game's extra effort system, I guess? No, it hasn't really changed much. It's only pretty much been, well, not simplified, it's become more clear on what you can do with it and how it works. You can get more cards, you can ignore tem temporary aspects that can give you penalties, you can reduce incoming damage, and you can even use some contracts. Contracts essentially being good stuff at a price. You get a powerful weapon, but you cannot use any other weapons. You get a companion, but if the companion dies, you are in a world of hurt. You gain extra money, but you have to get your money back, back or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, even, th even though this is a, ver a very Fae-leaning game, I think it's important to note that you're not playing as the Fey folk themselves, but as humans that were affected by a Fey. Correct. At some point in the history of the world of Man and Glamours, uh, the Fey cursed mankind, and from that curse, a lot of bad things happened. People began get, uh, being born with various deformities, others began being... Others became more monstrous, others were bound with the souls of fairy spirit animals. And the face still linger around in the earth. A big part of the game is about you know, 
finding where these they are, what things they do, and stopping the things they do. Since they're primarily evil, or at least neutral mm. to evil. I'd say, I'd say you couldn't really put the Fey in in any sort of alignment chart because because Fey, because what may be because Fey have a um, a different sense of what is normal compared to everyone else. Yeah, you know things that ev things that everyone else would consider insane are perfectly normal to them, and vice versa, or just things that just don't make any sense. Um, mm hmm. But you've you've described you've described it as five different curses: the changeling, the trolls, the garo, the dwarves, and the elves. Mm -hmm. uh, now, given that this is meant to be a very light of a very light affair, uh, since this is a zine, with each of those five with each of those five curses, what so, what sort of is it a case where each of them has their own little benefit and drawback? Yes, in a way. Uh, so each curse, it's pretty much you can call it a race in another game. Each of the as each of the curses gives you three positive aspects and three negative aspects related to your curse, mm. which you cannot get otherwise. It's they're obviously supernatural or otherwise unobtainable. For example, having supernaturally empathic and having visions on the positive side, on the negative side, being more sickly, or having an intense identity crisis. Or, for another example, you have monster strength, a huge body, you're practically unbreakable, but at the same time, you can, connect, you can control, your, control your strength, and you also look like a monster, which can, have negative, can be negative in some situations, while positive in others. Just because I call them positive and negative aspects doesn't mean they are overtly negative or overtly positive. Both can have advantages and disadvantages. While hiding a huge body will, of course, be a detriment. On the other side, if you if you are but ugly and frankly looking like an actual monster, people will be more easily scared of you and can be useful in intimidating others. Mm -hmm. But in most common social situations, such as persuasion or seduction or anything of that sort. Being monstrous looking is a is a uh, detriment. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, when it when it comes to, when it comes to contracts, uh, you mentioned before that contracts are double that um they have an advantage and a disadvantage. But is the do you have a are you gonna have a short list of how contracts can look so that people have kind of a baseline of what we do we have around done count we have around if I'm counting this right around twelve different contracts that you can use but you can also use as examples mm -hmm. with various effects and with various effects they're not just the same thing over and over. And also, there's stuff that you know a person will realistically have make a contract about, like for example, bringing somebody back from the grave or getting finding true love, with obvious negatives. Mm -hmm. Which that's that certainly makes sense. That certainly makes sense. Is it a case where you're picking one of you're picking one of them or built or building one at char at character creation and possibly getting more as you go on? Pretty much, you're not forced to take them. You can't take them because they have they have downsides, which can be real detrimental if you're not able to manage them correctly. Mm -hmm. A character creation can get one to three contracts, but later on in the game, if you find a fey, you could potentially strike another deal, get another contract. Mm -hmm. I can I can get I can get that. As it part. Given given that given the nature of that, is it possible for someone to lo to lose contracts or tr or even um even trade one even trade them for new ones? Well, theoretically, yes, by RP there is no by RP yes that is possible. I don't have any specific rules on that, but most likely yes. 
if you, for, for example, kill the Fey or somehow manage to blackmail them or force them to, you know, void a contract, it's possible. But again, that's, I think, I say it's up to the GM because different Fey will bend under different circumstances. Hell, some might even not bend. They might say, no, fuck you. You got that contract, you cannot undo it. Yeah. Within the... a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the game is sort of up, left up to GM interpretation, though not a huge part of it. Yeah, this is de this is definitely one of the one of those kind of affairs. Um, when I look at the contracts that were in the prototype, each of them seems to have a boon, a bane, and a ban. I mm -hmm. think it's important to go into what the, to what that entails, especially if there's the possibility of people building their own contracts with the system. So, a boon is the good part about your contract. It's essentially, for example, you can see the future, you can become invisible, you can heal others, you can make somebody fall in love with you instantaneously, you can find somebody from 30 miles away. The bane is the exact opposite. It's something, it's something that the contract doesn't allow you to do, or some sort of detriment. Or limitation to your boon. The ban, on the other hand, to explain the ban, I must also bring out another thing, that being gloom. So, essentially, all the glamoured are at least partly connected to the Fey, and thus they're more likely to fall to their corruption. The, b the ban is essentially a sort of rule. That if they break, as per their contract, they risk getting gloomed and essentially losing their character at some point. It's a sort of it's your average humanity slash sanity tracker, but with a bit of a more eldritch twist. Mm -hmm. That cer that yeah. certainly makes sense. So with with that in, with that in mind. In character creation, there there is also the talk of thinking of three positive aspects and a negative aspect, um, which is which is also changed. How how has that changed? So as I mentioned in the past, each aspect was a plus one bonus, but now that they have different ratings, you have a bunch, you have a few points that you can use to gain as to create aspects of different rarities. For example, you can have four. Four aspects that are two points each, or one four point one and three one points, or any combination of that. Mm -hmm. You're limited to just four, though. Yeah. Which I I can I can see why that why that might be done, since some people may want to have their characters have more disadvantages. Yes, which, speaking of, I forgot to mention that, you can also have negative aspects that give you more points to get more positive aspects. Mm -hmm. But, with, now, with that said, obviously, setting-wise, this is, this is leaning towards the modern day with, the, with a twinge of the supernatural. But mm -hmm. within the description on the Kickstarter, you mention the Global Office of Metaphysical Affairs. Um, yes. What exact What exactly does that office entail? Is it some Is it something like a supernatural version of the Men in Black, or something like that? A bit like that. Are you familiar with the Hellboy and the BPRP and the BPRD? Oh yeah. They're pretty much like that. They're an organization that is focused around. Researching into mysteries and various affairs that are obviously related to the Fey, be it various environmental dis the disturbances outside of Hong Kong, or a cult song springing up in your average small town in rural USA. Mm -hmm. And that's where most players are, are working for. There, there are essentially three tiers of campaigns, to put it, which I call, which I range them from small town mysteries to big city cases to global conspiracies. Characters don't necessarily have to be part of the of the office, though the more you know dangerous and the more wide scale a, a mystery is, the more likely they'll either stumble, they'll end up working for, or or are already working for the office. Mm -hmm. Because at lower levels, they can just be just a f be c citizens of small town USA. 
who suddenly are worried about their parents or the family family members being indoctrinated in the, by this mysterious evil cult that does weird things in the forest at night. Mm -hmm. Which that sort of small small town, but but weird, but things not making sense happen sounds not too far removed from say Twin Peaks. Strange things. Mm -hmm. Or if you're talking about the RPG space, Tales from the Loop, or Kids on Bikes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to invoke Twin Peaks because one, I, I like the show, and two, and two, it's a good visual represent representation. Um, it is. I was gonna I was gonna bring up Deadly Premonition, but Deadly Premonition is weird for a lot of different reasons. <laughs> but the reasons being. At, t at times, it, at times, it feels like a weird trip. Like I'm. Wow. Then again, then again, it was one of Swery's projects, and he's a very interesting developer. But you had, but you had mentioned a t a tier above that, and it's it sounds like that's where you're getting more into more into the urban fantasy, more into. Um, Proper sit proper city sized adventures. Yes, which is where plots like the ones from The Wolf Among Us, or say, what's another good example to provide? Well, I mostly use The Wolf Among Us or the or Fables because it's a more recognizable one. It's also it was a big inspiration for the game in the first place. You know, fairy tales, fairies, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. What would be the third tier then? Is that where is that where you're having people that are more higher ranking within the organization? It's where it comes to global situations. For example, the the fair trying to bring out a huge monstrosity from deep within the waters to swallow an entire city whole and make it underwater. Mm -hmm. And already it was a called an an or a specific person of interest. It's where a lot of things are at stake and the dangers are extremely high. That's where you go into Hellboy, the BBRD territory. The characters are usually very powerful agents or otherwise have to take on very dangerous missions. Mm -hmm. Not that the rest cannot be dangerous, it's just a lot more is at stake at that point. Mm -hmm. And... With the, now, with that in mind, obviously, obviously, since this is going to be a light affair, as I mentioned before, since this is a zine. Um, yeah. What are you shooting for as far as a page count? For page count, uh, it's around thirty-four pages, not including the cover and the back page, uh, and the back cover. In total, 32 pages. It's not big, it's quite simple, A lot there's a lot of GM fiat in the mix. Though, one thing I will say is that because of its simplicity, I might make more of these type of card games related to, you know, dark, otherworldly things. Perhaps I could make something about, you know, vampires in the future, or something about, uh, say, something more lethal company, where you play a space guy starting to survive on a space station. A bit. A thing I really like about the, g the game uh, that I found later on in the development is how it's not exactly for me, Lake. How much it can be, you know, taken, ripped apart, and remade. It can be a very versatile game. You can make, you know, all the well. You can base all the games on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I can certainly get that. Now, what would you be shooting as far as a release window? Not a date, per se, but a ballpark, as it were. Well, provided the XR goes well, around the around the middle of March. Though if it doesn't go well, uh, probably later in the month, later in March. All right, I, I can get I can get behind that. Oh, and I'll cer I'll certainly be keeping an eye on how things develop with it, especially since, as mentioned, there's a lot of potential with card games. Oh. The Kickstarter hasn't been doing too hot, though that's partly because of it being a decent record time in my life right now, and and I've been able to do a lot of work on promoting or pushing the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I think I also got a bit uh, kicking the nuts by Kickstarter because it did not have the Zine Quest tag when Zine Quest began. 
and thus I think it went a little bit up, uh, away from the spotlight. But I don't know, who knows, maybe it's just not as good as other projects, which is not unlikely. Yeah, well, these 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 things happen. But... Yeah, I know. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens here. And as it, you... It's my pleasure, really. <laughs> yep. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!